Good morning. Welcome to another Wake Up with Ashland. My name is Eric Brooks. I am the curator here at Ashland, the Henry Clay Estate. And it's great to be with you on this beautiful spring morning. A little chilly out today, but otherwise bright and sunny and a gorgeous day. Great day to be working. Uh, today I have a very interesting collection to show you. Uh, it is our archival collection. Um, Ashland is not an archive per se. That is to say, it is not our primary function to hold documents and other related materials for the purpose of servicing researchers who are doing research uh, to produce historical documents or whatever. Um, we have a small collection that primarily serves either to be exhibited when we do exhibits or in the rooms or sometimes to inform exhibits uh, or other projects that we're doing. So uh, it's, a, it's not a huge collection and it's mostly arrived recently. Some of it's been around a longer time. Uh, back in about 1991, 92, we moved the majority of our archival collection over to UK. UK Special Collections has the Henry Clay Memorial Foundation Papers, which is a huge collection of documents going from Henry Clay all the way up to, well, through his great-grandchildren. And good morning, Wood, speaking of Henry Clay's descendants. Good to see you today. Uh, it also includes about 1,800 photographs that were here. Uh, and it's great that they have them. They take great care of them. I have full access anytime I need to access or use them. Good morning, Sue, one of our volunteers. In fact, she will be here a little later this morning to do a tour. So we appreciate her very, very much. Um, so anyway, most of that went there because we just don't have the space or the facilities to make materials available to researchers. Uh, UK has several collections of important documents relating to Henry Clay and his family, um, including some uh, on some of the other branches of the family. So uh, you can check those out online. There's a portal called Explore UK where you can look at those collections. The HCMF papers, for example, you can go item by item. And all of the photographs have been scanned, so you can look at all of those online, uh, which is great. It saves a lot of time and trouble than having to go and just pull a box and go through a whole box of photos. So anyway, good morning, Shirley. Um, so, ah, good morning, Brad, another good friend of the estate and relative of Henry Clay. Thanks for watching. Uh, so those are all available. Transylvania has a very nice archive. Uh, with some important documents, including the earliest letter ever written by Henry Clay. He wrote it when he was 15 years old, so quite an interesting document. Uh, the Lexington Public Library has a space called the Kentucky Room, which is at the main branch downtown. Um, the Kentucky Room has a really fascinating collection, uh, including some very important material. There's a photo album, for example, of the, in, taken during the McDowell era that contains some really remarkable images of Ashland, which are all online now. Uh, good morning, Mike, another of our volunteers. Um, so there are a variety of collections out there that you can visit just right here in town um, if you're interested in doing that. What we have today are some materials we hold, like I say, that mostly we use for exhibits and things of that nature. So I'm going to go ahead and get started. I've pulled quite a few things, so let's take a look. This is one of my favorite images. Uh, this is called The Same Old Coon, that's Henry Clay, on a raccoon's body. Uh, good morning, Stephen Richardson. Thanks for joining us. Uh, this image was a common campaign image used in 1844, particularly. Um, this starts out in 1840. Uh, this image was originally created uh, for William Henry Harrison, who was sort of an outdoorsy type, grew up in a cabin. Um, so they had this image that became a type image for the Whig Party, of which Henry Clay was a part. Good morning, Mr. Stone. And it's meant to say he's a Whig like other Whigs, he's, he's going to continue Whig policies. So that's a political cartoon. This is also somewhat political. It is a parade in support of Henry Clay. This is a drawing, actually. Uh, and this was donated by someone who found it in a book. And that's not uncommon if you find old books. People seem to want to store things in books. Uh, and so if you have old books, it's a good thing to go through and see what might be there, particularly old Bibles. I'll show you some things from an old Bible in a bit. If you look carefully here, you can see uh, protecting, protection to domestic industry, the Whigs of 76. These are all Whigs-related campaign signs. You can see all the people in their costume. The Coons are coming. 
Henry Clay. It's quite an interesting document, quite detailed. Somebody did some really amazing drawing to create this thing. So, pretty remarkable. This document uh, is the official journal publication of the American Colonization Society, or ACS. Henry Clay was a staunch supporter of this, uh, was uh, a member of this, was its president for about 20 years. This one is from March 1830. And you can see here, this contains an address that Henry Clay delivered uh, in Frankfurt, December 17, 1829. So, uh, it is important both as a document of the ACS, but also contains this important address. Good morning, Mary, another of our volunteers. Now, we actually have a couple of these. Uh, this is a very important subject. I will probably at some point do an entire wake-up just on the ACS. It's a fascinating topic, uh, one of great complexity. Um, but this is part of our holdings on that topic. We have a number of Henry Clay speeches, uh, copies. They were generally printed. Usually what would happen is, a, is journalists would show up and they would actually write down the speech as it was given and then take it back, clean it up, and publish it in papers. Sometimes Henry Clay would say, I will provide you a copy, so don't write this down because he wanted it to be exactly right. This is one of his most important speeches. This speech was delivered... February 5th, 1850, on the floor of the United States Senate, and it is in relation to the 1850 Compromise and the issue of slavery. This particular speech is one of four documents that Abraham Lincoln used when writing his first inaugural address. Good morning, Annette. Good morning, Sarah. Great to have you with us. And we have a number of other speeches, of course, in the collection. I just chose this one because it's a particularly important one. Now, this document came with... An engraving we have in the collection of the Battle of Buena Vista, where Henry Clay Jr. was killed. This is an advertisement for the sale of that document. These would have been posted in places, stores perhaps, or around town, so that if people wanted them, they could buy them. You can see it was a $3 document. This one's actually been conserved, this particular uh, broadside. You can see they've mounted it to a backing material. Uh, which consolidates it and ensures it survives, and it describes the the, the engraving here at the bottom. Um, this actually came with the copy Henry Clay was given by Mr. Robinson in memory of his son. So, uh, really important document. Quite an interesting advertisement, actually. Last week, if you watched, Dr. Summers, good morning, uh, to my wife, my wife and LV, our cat, are watching, probably in bed. Great to have you with us this morning. Um, but if you watched last week, uh, Dr. Summers talked about the fact that in the pre-Civil War era, money, paper money, was printed by banks. Each state had different banks, and they each printed their own money, and so there were thousands of different currencies. Well, Henry Clay happened to be featured on a number of those currencies. We have the Northern Bank of Kentucky. This is from right here in Lexington. Uh, this one is from the state of North Carolina. There's Henry. They're actually really quite attractive bills. This one is from the Merchants and Planters Bank, state of Georgia. There's Henry Clay. My ancestors might have carried this very bill. I have ancestors from Georgia. Good morning, acquaintance. Thanks for joining us. Uh, this one is from the Bank of East Tennessee. And there again, so we have four bills showing four different images of Henry Clay, which I think is pretty cool. Um, it would have been used around the country. Now, some of you may be wondering, was Henry Clay ever on U.S. currency? And for that answer, if I move my state bills, I don't have an original of this because it is very, very, very rare. There are very few of these. Henry Clay was, in 1869... The face of the United States $50 bill. And that was about six months in 1869 that he was on that bill. And you can see him right there. Like I say, these are incredibly scarce. So we don't have any of these. Uh, but that's what it looked like. Uh, and then he left that bill, and it's been Grant for most of the time since. Good morning, Sarah. A lot of talk about elections these days and election security. 
They kept things pretty simple in Clay's day. A book was kept, and when you came in, you cast your vote. They wrote your name down and your vote. This one is from Wayne County, Kentucky. You can see it's for the election of 1844. H. Clay and Theodore Frelinghuysen, James K. Polk and George Dallas. And you can see here that Clay won 535 to 342 for a margin of victory of 193 votes. Total votes counted 877. And if you opened it up, it unfolds and you can see everybody's vote. So not only did they not have much question about who voted, they can tell you exactly how they voted. So there's really no question at all. You don't have to worry about it. You know exactly who's who. This is one of two we have in the collection. The other is downstairs on exhibit and it's from Illinois. And we have it because it shows Abraham Lincoln as elector. Now, this document is a really interesting document. This is the place card that sat at Henry Clay's place at the Treaty of Ghent negotiations. Uh, you can see here Henry Clay, Minister of Plenipotentiary Extraordinary from the United States of America. Those are some big words, and what they basically mean is that Mr. Clay had the authority of the United States government to sign on documents and enter into get documents. Uh, Mr. Riley, I noticed you mentioned the gloves. I wear gloves for a lot of things, and the reason for that is that it, the, the lack of uh, tactile control is a greater risk than my hands. My hands are clean. I, you know, I washed my hands before I did this, so it's okay to handle these documents uh, with good, clean hands. Uh, gloves are, like I say, used for some things. That's why I'm not using them today, though. I don't often use them with paper because it's just too hard to handle paper oftentimes with gloves. Um, so that's what this document says. Clay could negotiate on behalf of the United States government without having to get approval first. And when you're across an ocean at a time when communication would have taken weeks or months, you had to have that right. So um, it's an important document. I acquired this uh, from a family in Ghent, who had been collecting political documents for a very long time and had this in their collection. So it's quite a fascinating piece. We have quite a collection from Ghent. We have a large collection of sheet music. Not large, a fairly sizable collection. Um, there was a lot of sheet music produced for Henry Clay for the 1844 campaign. This is a piece uh, that was produced for that campaign. It's called the American Marseillaise or the Voice of the People. There's Henry Clay. There's George Washington. And this is trying to connect... Henry Clay to the father of our country and the greatest statesman our country had had. Uh, favorite national heir. And this was done in 1844. This document is a handwritten note. Uh, Henry Clay requesting the company of W.P. Browning on Wednesday the 25th instant to dine uh, at Half past two o'clock with General Harrison, National 23rd November. The answer is requested. So this document, Henry Clay is inviting to a, gen a gentleman to a dinner with William Henry Harrison. This is uh, November of 1840. Henry Her William Henry Harrison has been elected president and uh, at this point is on his way to Washington. And he stops here at Ashland to meet with Henry Clay, discuss some political things, offers Henry Clay some positions in the government, which Henry Clay declines because he wants to stay in the Senate. Uh, but so this gentleman is being invited to have dinner with Henry Clay and William Henry Harrison here at Ashland. And this dinner actually happened on the date specified, which would have been uh, Wednesday, the 25th of November, 1840. So that's a pretty amazing document. And we've used that a number of times in setting the table, etc. This document... Uh, features a little cutting. That's a uh, cedar that was cut out of the garden here at Ashland on the day of Henry Clay's funeral. When Henry Clay died, somewhere between 30 and 100,000 people came to Lexington to mourn him. And they were everywhere. And many of them came to Ashland to pay their respects. And apparently, they ran pretty roughshod over the estate, taking clippings and cuttings and whatever they wanted or could find for souvenirs. So the place suffered a fair bit because of it. And this is one of those souvenirs. So it's a reminder of all these people. Uh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> Unfortunately, William Mary Harrison has two distinctions. Uh, he had the longest 
inaugural address in American history, and as a direct result, the shortest presidency, because he didn't wear a hat. It was cold, a raw March day, and he caught pneumonia and spent 30 days sick and then died. Um, so uh, the Whigs elected two people. They both accomplished the same general thing. They died in office. So, oh well. This is a letter written by Henry Clay's son, Thomas. He had very nice penmanship, as you can see. Um, this letter is to Reverend Edward Fairfax Berkeley, who was the minister at Christ Church Episcopal. This particular letter is a letter in which he is asking Reverend Berkeley to officiate a funeral for Sarah Sally Hall. Sally Hall was the Clay's English housekeeper. She had been with the Clay's since 1806, um, become very close to the family, and was someone that Tom had known pretty much his whole life, I mean, since he was a very small child. And so he wants to make sure she gets a funeral, and she did. And she is buried at the old Episcopal burying ground downtown. Hopefully someday I'll go down there and we'll do a wake up down at the old Episcopal burying ground because it's a fascinating place. We talked about things out of books. This is another thing out of a book. This is James B. Clay's calling card as charged affairs of the United States to Portugal. He went to Portugal to finish up some diplomatic business that his father had started during the negotiations of the Treaty of Ghent or around that time. Um, and would have used this card during that period. Cards like this were used uh, sort of like business cards. You would hand them off to people to introduce yourself. If you went to someone's house or someone's place of business and they weren't there, you could leave this card saying you would have been. And sometimes they would fold the corners. And you can see a little crease there. Um, you look really closely. And that fold would indicate something like, I came by and I'll come by later, or I came by, please call me, or or come to my house, or whatever. So there was a whole language that went into calling cards. And this is his. This came out of a family Bible. Family Bibles are frequent repositories of documentary information and little things like this. So if you have a family Bible, I highly recommend looking through it and seeing what's there and being careful uh, to document and preserve it. This also came out of the family Bible. These are drawings done by James and Susan's children. Um, some of them, this appears to be Harry Independence Clay with the beard. Um, this is mentioned Charles was one of their sons. So there's kids playing around and doodling. Either Susan saved it because she thought it was cute, or they stuck it in the Bible without her ever knowing it. This is another speech. James B. Clay served as congressman from the Ashland District to the United States Congress. Uh, and at that time, congressmen would come home uh, when Congress recessed, and they would deliver speeches giving the results of the previous Congress, everything that had done, been done in the past year. And that's what this is. He does this at Ashland, but this is his report to his constituents over what's been done. And I think that's really pretty cool. Uh, it would be nice to, to see that uh, still happen in some ways. So uh, that's his report uh, from July of 1858. This is a document that we actually acquired from the Speed Museum in Louisville. They, it, it didn't fit their mission at all. Uh, they had gotten it with some art that they acquired from the family. But this is an invitation to the Union Ball, which was Abraham Lincoln's first inaugural ball in 1861. And it was issued to Susan Jacob Clay, Mrs. J.B. Clay, now, James was actually in Washington at this time. He had gone to a thing called the Peace Conference, which was called by some folks in the state of Virginia, and the goal was to try to put off the Civil War. Well, obviously that didn't work, and even James didn't think it would work, but he went, and so he was there. Now, I doubt Susan, who was, I think, there with him. Hello, Lloyd. Great. We look forward to seeing you in May. We hope you'll be able to make it, and uh, look forward to your visit. Uh, so... I don't think Susan went. Uh, I, she may have just because she had the opportunity, but Susan was staunchly Confederate, and I just can't imagine her doing this, but maybe she did. And I think she was invited as a, the wife of a member of the Peace Conference and because she was Henry Clay's daughter-in-law. Lincoln, of course, idolized Clay. This is a sad document. Um, this is one that I always like documents like this that on their face don't necessarily appear important. But when you know the story, they're really quite important. This is a bill of lading for personal items, 
clothing, trunks, etc., that belong to James B. Clay. Nine boxes. They're being shipped back from Montreal. This is dated uh, March 16th, 1864. Uh, this is after James died in Montreal, and his stuff is being shipped home to Lexington. And that's the bill of lading that brought it back home. This document is what's called a marriage bond. This bond was issued uh, for Henry Clay Jr. and his wife, Maria Julia Prather, uh, daughter of Matilda Prather, who consents here to in writing. Uh, Julia was from Louisville, so this document was done in Louisville. Basically, when people got married, particularly people of the upper class, they signed a bond which said, we're getting married, we assert we will remain married and have a good marriage, etc. And if we don't, the money we put up in bond, which was $166.66 and two-thirds cents, is forfeit. So it was a way to ensure people were serious when they got married. Um, this one belonged, like I say, to Henry Jr. and his wife, Julia. We have other wedding documents in the collection, a number of wedding of, of marriage invite, wedding invites. This one is for uh, Henry Clay Jr. and Julia's granddaughter, Julia Prather, uh, who married Mr. William Bass Brock on Saturday the 12th of November, 1904, at Ashland. All three of the McDowell girls got married here at Ashland. She was the last. Unfortunately, by the time she got married, her father had passed which is why it only lists Mrs. Henry Clay McDowell announcing the, the marriage of her daughter. So uh, we have the invites of two of the three. There's a third at UK. Um, so we have a number of these in the collection. Um, this was somewhat a smallish wedding because, like I say, Major McDowell had died, and I think it was just easier to, to do that. This is a set of blueprints and specifications for a bathroom that was installed in Ashland, uh, for Anne Clay McDowell, probably after her husband died, uh, Mike Smith and Bedford Architects in Lexington, and you can see it here. So this bathroom was actually right where I'm now standing. So if you look at the window here at the front, I'm on the second floor. That's the window. That's the side light of the window, the wall of the bathroom connected to this piece between the side light and the main arched window here in our Palladian window. And it's stretched across here to about where that door jam is and came out to here. So where this painting is now and where the sofa is and that chair is, there was a toilet in the corner where the chair is and a tub where the sofa is and then a sink right about there. And this bathroom provided Anne the opportunity for a little more privacy. She could live essentially entirely upstairs. Uh, and it remained in use until between 1959 and 62, when her grandson moved out of the house. This bathroom was removed. And there is really no evidence of it now, except for this document. We have here a contract for electrical service. This uh, contract... Is for three years, Anne Clay McDowell. You can see it's actually done with the Lexington Railway Company. So in addition to railways, they're providing electric. May 1907, uh, and this is for 16 incandescent lamps. See there. So they're providing electric to the house. Now, this we know in 1892 when Nanette got married here at Ashland that they electrified the tent in which they attached to the back of the house and some parts of the house for the wedding. That was the first time we know of electricity at Ashland. We don't know of any of that being permanent. So this may be the first time that electric was installed in a permanent way at the estate. Certainly, it's beginning to expand and become a major part of life at the estate at that point. Um, so it's an interesting document that gives us an understanding of the development of the estate uh, over time. A heck of a lot cheaper, minimum uh, $5 a month uh, for electricity. So <laughs> a lot cheaper then than it is now. This is a critically important document to me because without it, I wouldn't necessarily be here. These are the original articles of incorporation for the Henry Clay Memorial Foundation. 
Uh, you can say, see here that they were recorded at the Fayette County Clerk's Office, and it's got the box number. You can see that these were dated April 2, 1926. That, ladies and gentlemen, is 95 years ago tomorrow. So, this is what creates the foundation that still operates the estate. This is what ensures that we become a museum. Incredibly important document for us and for our existence now. When we opened in 1950, it was quite the event. This is the program from the original opening. Um, you can see here they've replicated a piece of sheet music called the Ashland Quick Step. I think we actually have a piece of the original in the collection performed by a brass band, and there were a number of brass bands in town. If you open it up, you can see the order of program. We had a lunch, parade by the Henry Clay High School band, a concert by the band, invocation, a couple of uh, musical pieces, including the Ashland Quick Step. The signature, the, the main speaker was Vice President of the United States, Alvin Barkley, who was introduced by Thomas Underwood. Um, he made an address. We actually have the program that he used with all of his notations on it down framed in the cottage. And over here are all the guests. You can see these are all the living descendants that they had at the, at the event. Many of these folks have unfortunately now passed, although some of their descendants are living. In fact, some of their descendants are with us today on this very program. So those are all the people that came. Um, and these are our other honorable guests, various politicians. And then representatives of historical organizations. So, quite an event. And after we opened, this broadside was present, printed to advertise tours and things. Uh, it's got a nice engraving of, of Ashland in the middle. You are invited to pay your respects to the home of Kentucky's greatest statesman. If you look down at the bottom, you can see admission was a whole 50 cents, 25 cents for children. <laughs> Open 9.30 to 4.30. So... Uh, quite an attractive document. This was actually printed by a man by the name of Joseph Graves. Joseph Graves was on the original board uh, when the board formed and started operating in 1948, became the president of the board in fairly short order. Uh, among other things, he was a clothier. He and his partner, Mr. Cox, had a store called Graves Cox, which some of you probably have shopped at, as unfortunately now... Uh, gone out of business, uh, but it lasted for many, many years. But in addition to that, he was also a printer, and he had a small uh, block printing press, and this is something that he printed. He printed a lot of things for the estate during this period. And his son, Joe Graves Jr., lived across the street from us for many, many years, uh, was a really, really great guy. I got to know Joe fairly well. He was involved with the board, loved the estate, spent a lot of time here. Unfortunately, he passed away about a year ago. Or a little less than a year ago, so we miss him. I have some more modern documents. Here we have a set of stamps. Henry Clay has appeared on stamps a lot of times going all the way back to the 19th century. These are from, I believe, the late 80s, um, which was, I think, the last time Henry Clay appeared on a stamp. Um, and I have some materials upstairs in the collection from when these were first issued, the, the uh, first day cancellation, etc. But these were stamps featuring Henry Clay, recent stamps. So these were probably postcards or additional postage kind of stamps. And lastly, I want to focus on some things that I think are really fun. We have some cards. So this is a playing card. You can see there, uh, that's uh, one of the, I think that's a king. You'll note that there is no letter or number on this card because cards from this era didn't have them. This card is actually from Henry Clay's time. And yes, it came this way. I, I don't know how the stain got there, but it was there when we received it. This medal was given to Henry Clay by citizens of the city of New York, and it's reproduced here. So these cards were produced about 1855, I believe. Um, and I think it's great to have cards like this. Henry Clay was a great card player and would love the fact that he is now part of cards. 
Um, so he would have enjoyed that very much. This is another card. This one is from 1977. Again, features an image of Henry Clay. I'm not sure what else was in this deck. I don't know if there were other politicians. Here he's on the eight of clubs. And so now we've got numbers in suit to go with the suit. This little card is an interesting example. This is what's called a tobacco card. And these were first manufactured uh, in the 1880s and continued to be manufactured into the 1920s or even maybe early 1930s. Um, tobacco companies distributed them as premiums with packages of loose tobacco or sometimes cigarettes. Um, you can see here, this is from W. Duke & Sons, the largest cigarette manufacturers in the world. Uh, for those of you maybe not aware of it, they are also, Duke, the Duke family is the benefactors of Duke University. So that's where their funding originally came from. Uh, uh, they did all sorts of cards. They did entertainment figures, sports figures. Uh, they did politicians, all sorts of different things. And these are the original trading cards. And that obviously became a much bigger thing. Um, so that's part of this set. And you can see here, they're great Americans. They printed on the back all the other people who were in the set of cards. Well, eventually, people came to realize that Offering a premium primarily of interest to children in tobacco products was maybe not a great idea. You know, uh, maybe you don't want to encourage a generation after generation to get hooked on tobacco. So uh, they gave up this premium, and it was picked up by bubblegum companies. And in 1933, I think it was, Gowdy produced a set of bubblegum cards that had become legendary. Uh, and that continued on, and in 1952, a company called Topps came along, the Topps Chewing Gum Company, and produced a set of cards. They are now the largest producer of cards out there. This is a Topps card. I love this. This is Henry Clay's card. Wig, uh, Kentucky. Flip it over. It's got all his stats on it. You know, all of his information, just like a baseball card. You've got the little cartoon. These are actually based on an early 70s set of baseball cards that Topps did. Um, so uh, that's where the design comes from. When I saw this, I, I had to have one of these for the collection. I have collected baseball cards since I was probably five or six years old. And I still have my large collection. And I have a variety of other cards as well from popular movies mainly. Um, but when this set came out, I had to have the Henry Clay. This is the special limited numbered edition. You can see here, 387 out of 1776. And it's the special high gloss sort of metallic version as opposed to the regular flat version. Um, so not only do I have one here at Ashland, I bought this entire set for myself. So I have it at home in an album in appropriate pages. But I think that's pretty cool. Anybody that is famous enough to have their own trading card, you know, it's a pretty famous person. And it feels pretty good to know that I curate the collection of someone who actually has their own trading card. So you can see we have a wide range of items in our archival collection that cover a wide array of history and topics, um, often very attractive. I think it's quite interesting, some really neat material. Uh, we don't get a lot of this out very often, so it's nice to be able to do that. I'm happy to answer any questions anyone might have. I appreciate everyone tuning in this morning. Thank you for that. You're most welcome, Katrina. It's been a pleasure being here and doing this. Everyone have a great day. And we'll see you again soon with Wake Up With Ashland. I'm glad everyone enjoyed it. Hey, Becky, good to see you. Former co-worker and volunteer. Thanks, Brad. I'm glad you enjoyed it. It's great to have you with us. Uh, Lynn, we actually have tours open now. Um, if you go to our website, you can find all the information about tours. Um, as we're getting into April, um, we have a schedule of tours. Uh, Tuesday through Friday, uh, Tuesday through Saturday, um, and then we also offer opportunities for private tours, and all that information is on the website. So, yes, we are definitely open for tours. They are booking fast. They need to be booked online. You can find that information on the website. So check that out. Um, book ahead um, to be sure that when you come 
you have availability because we do have very limited capacity right now, uh, even still. Um, but yes, we're definitely open for tours and looking forward to seeing everyone soon. Well, again, thank you very much. Everyone have a great day, and we'll see you again soon with Wake Up for, with Ashland. Thank you.